Very warm greetings to all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now let us turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We have been studying how the Apostle Paul is instructing the Christian how to stand fast in the Lord. So do not forget the context. What we've been learning is God's formula, God's instruction to be unmovable in your Christian walk, to be steadfast. Well, of course, the first question is, are you a believer? Maybe you long for all these things, to have the peace of God, to well, live a life that has meaning for God. But all these are useless to you unless you have truly, in your heart, come to God, come to the Lord Jesus and say, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I want to have such a life with you. I do not want to end up in hell forever. Please save me today. And after I'm saved, please help me to walk in your ways, to glorify you. Now, dear friends, I say again and again, I fear that week after week you come to church, you hear, but you're not saved. These are just good moral stories for you. This is not what the Apostle Paul, this is not what God is using the Apostle Paul to write about, a moral life that can bring you peace. This is a peace with the living God that enables you to live for Him on earth. That when you meet Him, not only you will not fear judgment in hell, but you have the joy of knowing that you will live eternally with Him and have no regrets of how you live your life on earth. Now, to the believers, look at verse 8. Finally, finally, meaning to say an important culmination, an important aspect that the believer now must take note, not that the others prior to this are not important, but it boils down to this. Look at verse 2. You're seeking to be of the same mind with others, to live in peace. Your verse, um, verse 4, rejoicing in the Lord. Your verse 5, your self-control. Verse 6, your being without care and in communion with God. Verse 7, your peace in God. Now all this comes from one important aspect found in verse 8. What is it? Look at verse 8. Now I say that God gives a whole, loss, whole list of things for the believer to observe so that you will be stable in Christ, not fluctuate in your walk. But the key is not just the list. The key is found at the end of verse 8. Now it says, think on these things. Think on these things. The list is useless to you for your stability if you do not, if you do not think on them. Now the title today is being steadfast, standing fast in spiritual mindedness. Your thought life is crucial. You can understand all these things, know all these things. But what is the pattern of your thinking? That is crucial. Now, James 1.8, God says this, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You must know this. The stability of your Christian walk is dependent on your mind. Are you double-minded or single-minded? The mind is very important. And that is what we've been studying in the, in the Seniors Fellowship. And I've summarized in the pastorals. Your mind is crucial. Now, Proverbs 23, verse 7, God says, for, he, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you think about in your heart, how you think in your heart, that is what you are. Are you unstable? Then it's because your mind is double-minded. Are you not what you want to be? That is because 
you are not watching what you think about. What you think about shapes you, my friend. That is basically what God is saying. What you think about produces an end product that is you. You are what you think about. Now, you know, as we live in this world, one thing that keeps going on in our minds are thoughts. It's constantly there. Thousands and thousands, if not maybe even hundreds of thousands of thoughts going through our minds all the time. As we live life on earth, we are very careful with what we take in, what we eat, well, we believe what nutritionists say. You are what you eat. You are what you allow to come into your stomach. You are what you are in your intake. So they will tell you, be careful. Be very careful. We are very careful with where we go. Certain places are unsafe. We know. We avoid them. We are very careful. But when it comes to our minds, the Christian must realize this. God says it shapes you. It makes you who you are. It causes you to be stable or unstable. We then must be very conscious about our thought life. We must be very concerned, concerned about it, careful about it. Just like you don't, you don't eat rubbish. You must be also very concerned about what you allow to get into your mind, your intake of things. Just like you won't let your body wander and go to unsafe places. You are watchful. You must be watchful where you let your mind wander to. God uses these things, these verses, to show us whether you are healthy spiritually or not, stable or not. Whether verses 2 to verse 7 whether it will be true in your life depends on how you think and what you think about. Garbage in, garbage out. That's what people say. Many of us seem to think that is the outward act. Outward act that is sin. But dear friends, the Lord Jesus Christ himself explained for example, what is adultery? What is murder? Christ says very clearly in Matthew chapter 15, are you without understanding? He asked the disciples, don't you understand? He said, those things that proceed out of the mouth that come forth from the heart, they defile the man. What is, what is inside you? What originates from there? Those are what defiles you. It's not the outward action because the Pharisees think, we don't, as long as we don't commit it, we have not sinned. But God says, this is what is in your heart. And then Christ further says, from out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. What lodges in your heart? Is it evil or, it is, or is it holy? Is it godly or is it ungodly? That is what defiles you. Not just the action. It begins there. Of course, the action themselves are sinful. So, dear friends, Christ makes it very clear. Out of the heart proceeds both evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witnesses, blasphemies. For these are the things that defile a man. It's not the outward washing of hand and you outwardly look so holy. My friends, you may live very outwardly holy lives. Parents in front of your children. Christians in front of your friends in church. But the question is, what is happening in this mind of yours? What are the thoughts of your heart? Like people say, a man can be on an island with himself even if he's sitting among a thousand people. What do they mean? You can be on your own island in your thought. No one knows. You can be talking, smiling. You can be saying holy things. But your mind is on a different island. So my friends, Paul says, God says, finally, it boils down to your pattern of thinking. 
Now, before we go into the list, God willing, we'll do that next week. We must begin with think on these things. So that when we go through the list and understand what they are, you know that for each item, how you should think. How you should think. Because this think, there is a pattern to this word. Have you been struggling, my friends? Have, been, have you been longing to be godly, to be holy? Have you been feeling that you've been trying and as far as you know that when well, you come to church, you study His Word, but you know that your, your life is still far from what a stable, non-yo-yo Christian life is. Now, we're not talking about sinless perfection. Please understand that. But that semblance of stability is very absent. But you want it and you've been trying. What is the problem? You study. Well, I think the problem lies in our failure to understand what this word think means. We think that we are thinking. But are we really? So let's begin with this word thing. All right? The pattern of this thinking. Well, we live in a three-dimensional world. We see, we hear, we smell, we touch, we feel. Maybe I use 4D, all right? 4, 4D, the alphabet D, um, the letter D to help us to remember. Really, the Christian walk is in the fourth dimension, all right? In another dimension. What is going on in the dimension of your mind? You may live in a three-dimensional world. Now, the first D, how, what does this word think mean? Now, four aspects to this particular choice of word. Now, it is the word logizomai. It's where we get the English word logic. Logic, all right? Now, the first thing, the first D is depth. Depth. You may think that you're thinking, but you have to ask yourself, Am I thinking with depth? This word actually means to contemplate deeply, to reason, to come to logic, understanding. Without understanding, there's no logic. So you actually seek to think deeply and to develop a good conviction and understanding of things. Reason carefully, to ponder. Right? In fact, Proverbs tell us, Proverbs, 20, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26, let me read to you. Ponder the path of thy feet and let thy ways, let all thy ways be established. Ponder. So this word is pondering. It's not shallow, cursory, superficial thinking. My friends, when you come to church, when you attend Bible studies, what is your attitude? Because there are many that can have this attitude. I, I do not like details. There are people who actually say, I do not like depth. You know, I'm a simple person. Just tell me simple things. Now, once you go anything deeper, uh, my eyes glaze over, I'm, I'm not interested. Now, unless you say everything in life, you're like that in everything in life, I don't know what to say to you. But we know that things that we are interested, we go deep in them. So Christian... Is your Christian life unstable because you have not been pondering the path of thy feet? It takes effort. It takes concentration. It requires you to evaluate things, reason in your heart, pay attention. Now, I'm not saying that preaching must be very difficult, very convoluted, very complex, um, with, with big theological terms. We want, it should be un, easily understandable, digestible. But it does not mean that everything is going to be like that. Even scriptures, God says, there, will be things, there are things that are hard to be understood. God lays it out for you. God lays it out for you that milk... It's good, milk is important, but it will only last you for so long. The Corinthian Christians, many of them still want to be shallow. Just give me milk. Easy to digest, right? Milk, that's what it is. Anything, meat, no thank you. Not interested. 
And Paul had to rebuke them. It's time for you to have meat. There are many things I need to say to you, but you do not want it. And for so many years, you do not want it. By the time I talk to you about it, you can't even understand it. Have you been a Christian for a long time? And you just know, well, hi, I'm going to be saved. I hope so. And uh, Jesus loves me. And this I know. And that's about it. John 3.16 is the main verse that you know, and that's it. And that's all you care. Why is our life not stable? Because of that. We don't go deep. You see, when a tree has deep roots, that is when it's stable. You must remember that. How deep are your roots? Now, this leads to another thing about depth, my friends. One of, I think, the unconscious thing that goes on in our minds whenever we have to think is this. Think about doctrines, think about religion, think about, sorry, Christianity is this. We don't like to think. We like to feel. We like to be moved to feel. Anything that is requiring me to think is too tiring. I don't want to go into deeper. I like messages that stir me, that make me feel good, that make me feel that I love God. Now, I'm not saying that messages should not have that, should not do that. But what I'm saying is this. Feelings. It's, feelings are not objective. Feelings change. Feelings cannot be depended upon as a result. God did not say, God did not say, well, these things, well, feel it. I want you to feel truth. I want you to feel honest things. I want you to feel just. God says, think. In fact, this word is often used to talk about accountants, accounting, the accounting process, all right? Um, balance data and make sure that they all check out. It's not about feeling. Your feelings must come from deep thinking of facts that you spend time reasoning, evaluating, coming to a conviction, a conclusion about and that becomes feelings, emotions that can be very, very firm. That whenever your feelings go, you're under pressure. You're, you're, under, you're going through troubles. You're under fearful situations. You're anxious. You're troubled. You're sad. Those are your feelings. But because it has been through thinking, the right pattern of thinking. During peace time, you build that depth that when the wind blows, you are stable. The feelings may be gone at that time, but you are stable. So, dear friends, when you come to church, when you learn things, that's why I say before we even going through whatsoever things are, you must know that for every item, it is not what it makes me feel. It is how much I understand about it, pay attention to it, make it mine. Spiritual mindedness is not an emotional feeling and response only. Remember that. Now Paul says, I press. Now look at look at verse chapter three. Chapter three, verse eight. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost. For Christ, verse 7. Now verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the feeling of Christ Jesus. My feelings towards Christ Jesus. No, for the excellency of the knowledge. He was not seeking emotional highs, but he was seeking the excellency of the knowledge. Knowledge, because he knows that knowledge, that deep thinking, that soundness, that groundedness of knowing God that is what will help him to press on. Verse 10, that I may feel that I love him, that I may sense these strong emotions, no, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and a list of things. Right? So please understand that when you say, I, I don't seem to be stable, is it because 
you have always sought a shallow, I know some things that is good enough Christianity. Now, this can be very, very much so with the elderly and the young ones. The elderly say, ah, these are too, too deep things, not interested. BBK, oh, so many th things, not interested. But young people, oh, these are for adults. So the first D, all right? The depth of thinking. You must change. If you're someone who has been, well, the moment it goes any more than I'm interested in, I glaze over. I choose to sit far behind in church, far away, because, well, if I start to doze off, when I start to be disinterested, no one knows. Children or teens or young people in class, if you want to be very good, know a topic very well, very, be very, very um, um, well-versed in a topic. I know students that when they start class, before start, class starts, they are there 10 minutes ahead of time. Why? I remember my students' day. They want to sit right in front. They want to hear every word. They don't want to be distracted. They want to go really deep in the topic because they want to get good results because of interest, Right? The playful ones sit as far behind as possible because I'm not interested to hear anymore. I just roughly, I know I can make it, part, I can pass and that's it, right? So are you not stable? Is it because of that? Now, second D, the second D. Now, this word actually, like I mentioned earlier on, is used very often with accounting work, accounting work. work. In other words, in accounting now, it's making having an account, taking an account, a list, a detailed list of things. So the second D to remember is details. Not only depth, but breadth, details. So like I said, this word means not just pondering, evaluating, contemplating. Now it means to include making an account, making a list of things. That's what the accountants do. They take all the finances. They take account of every line that the company spends. They have a detailed inventory. We are not stable. Is it because we don't like details? Is it because we have been fashioned by the world. Now, you know, there is this um, trend today that is meditation. The world, when they're under stress, when they want peace, they, they, they want to have a control of their lives, well, they go for meditation. And in these meditation sessions, typically what they are encouraged to do is this. Clear your mind. Empty it. Not fill it with a lot of details. Details stress you. But God's way here in verse 8 is giving you a list of things to focus your thinking on. God is a God of details. Now, emptying your mind is a very dangerous thing. Philippians 4.8 tells us for the Christian is not empty your mind, it's fill your mind with the things of God, of course. Emptying your mind subjects your mind and leaves it open to Satan's suggestion. Many false religions come about because the founder were meditating keeping their minds empty and then certain thoughts come into their mind and they feel that they have found the truth. Now, uh, do you feel that I'm saved already? I don't need details. Is that your thinking? Now, the other thing is this. Now, think about an accountant Accountant take notes of things. They notice things. They are supposed to do that. 
And then they record it. Part of our ACM um, report is to have the accounting report done, right? And the right details must be there. They must all tally. Now, throughout the year, we do all that for a purpose, to make sure that things are right and it can be reported. This word, think, in other parts of Scripture, is used also about God. God's thoughts. God did not take account of our sins. Now, what does it mean? It means this. God makes a list. God has a list of all our sins. And he has it for a purpose for future action. The accountant don't take things just to keep details for the sake of liking details. Keeping details for some future application, some for, from, some, for some future action. That is what it is. Our sins are counted in the presence of God. That one day God will judge it. Friends, please know that. Every single thought that no one knows that you think about in your heart, in your mind, every action that you've done in secret, no man may ever know in your lifetime. But God knows. They're all accounted for. For the purpose of one day, he will take action of judgment. Judgment, if they're not washed away in the blood of Christ, then judgment of eternal judgment in hell, forever and ever. No reincarnation, no coming back up. But for the believer, God has the list. But the future action is written off. I will not judge. So this word has, has the meaning of taking details for a purpose of future action. Now, why is this important to understand? Why are we not stable? Because we don't like details. I want to sit there and listen and listen and listen. When I'm interested, I pay attention. When not, uh, this one, this detail, I'm not interested. We write it off. Now, an accountant cannot do that. Everything that is, that is present, he has to be attentive, take down the notes. Do you only write things that you're interested in? Now, this taking notes, uh, taking, taking account for future action means this. For stability... You note things that you know you must deal with. Why are we not stable? We think that we are thinking. Because well, we've been attending Bible studies. Well, we have been listening. We have been taking uh, Far Eastern Bible College classes. But are you thinking, as God says, think on these things? It means are you taking note of things for yourself to act on? Now, if you don't write down, note to myself, how will you change? How will you apply? You see, for the accountant, they must study not just in depth, they must study every rule, every regulation that the government comes up with. For what? They will take details of those things. And they know this applies to my company. I have to take note of it. And when the time comes, I must apply it. And whenever the company spends money, does things, I must be watching, this is not according to regulation. I noted it, and I must act now. You see, the thing is, our, our instability is because of our lack of taking note for ourselves. That when things happen, we, we, it doesn't even occur to us that this is wrong. Or you just vaguely remember, I know, actually, this is how to respond. This is what I need to do. But I can't remember the rest. Your mental note, right? Whether you physically take notes, that's always the best, right? You are making a mental note. Not listening casually, not reading the Word of God um, without intending to take note for yourself. All the details, what does it mean to me today? What is it saying to me about what 
choices I've made? What is it telling me in its principles about what I'm going to make choices about? Why are we unstable? Is it because we are only concerned that we are saved? I don't really need to read the Bible, go for Bible study in depth. When I read scriptures, well, actually, I don't need all the details. Is that true for us? Don't just listen and forget. This word think means take down notes for yourself. Now, next D. All right, next D. It has to do with discipline. Discipline. I think this is where most of us fail. Most of us, well, we are interested to know in depth the Word of God. We even take notes. We even make instructions for ourselves. But we are not disciplined. Now, this discipline is like the accountant again, all right? The accountant, he may, know, he may attend all the courses about the regulations, but he does not control, discipline himself to say in, the, in every situation, in every accounting step, I would, in a very um, a disciplined way, put in effort to make sure that I am doing it and doing it rightly. I'm entering these details, this account, in the right place. I dis I'm disciplined in using what I've known about the laws. I do not just do what I feel like, what is comfortable, what is easy. In fact, the Bible tells us to gird up the loins of thy mind in 1 Peter 1.13. Let me read to you. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. What is this gird up the loins of your mind? Peter is using a picture, all right? The loins, the middle body. For these people, they wear this long flowing um, garment, all right? Even the men, this long flowing garment. And every time they need to run, every time they need to um, move, every time they need to do something, they gird it up, they fold it, they roll it up, they fold it under their belt. Means they don't let this garment fly all over the place and become a hindrance that will cause them to trip, that will slow them down, that will impede them. So Peter uses this picture, gird up the loins of your mind. It's like your mind. Your mind has all these things. It's going in all sorts of direction. It's flying all over the place. You need to gird it up. You need to bring it together. Don't be double-minded. Don't let your mind go everywhere. Know where your mind needs to go. Control it. Discipline it. Wrap it around what God wants you to wrap it around, which is the list we'll cover next week, God willing. So it's not just digesting, it's not having depth, but it's having discipline after that. Now this command, think on these things, it's in the present, all right? It's in present. It means it's something that is now and it, you must keep doing it. At any point of time, you must be disciplining your mind. Like I said, I think this is where most of us fail. If you wonder why I come for Bible study, I want to obey God, but this is where we fail. Example. Think is not a command just for Sundays. Think is not a, just a command for when you are reading the Bible during your quiet time. But think is a command that is for 24 by 7. 24 by 7. As long as you are awake and can control your thoughts, that is how we think. That is the meaning of this word. It is an ongoing, ceaseless effort to rein in to guide your thoughts. Now, when you're with your friends, when you are with your friends in school, when we are with your friends at work, when you're with your family at home, what are you thinking about? Where does your mind go? How do you control your mind? 
all the time. You see, when God chose this word, it's chosen specifically to help us to realize even when you are alone, where is your mind? When you're surfing the internet, when you're watching the news, when you're at work, when, with, when, when you are with people that you're very casual with, what do you feed your mind with? Do you allow the conversation that is going on to take your mind wherever it goes? Or are you very disciplined? Hang on, they are going down a certain road. They're talking about certain things which I know is going to be a problem for me. Now, if you cannot leave the conversation, do you just mindlessly follow it? Or do you start to think on these things? Like I said, we will learn. Discipline it. Discipline it. This discipline, in other words, is about a habitual pattern, my friend. A habitual pattern. If you do not have a habitual pattern of controlling where your mind goes, in private, in public, you will fall. You fall into trouble. Now, let me ask you a question. Where does your mind naturally gravitate towards? Where does it naturally gravitate towards? I'm not asking you whether you study the Word of God. I'm not asking you whether you do your quiet time. I'm not asking you whether um, you feel your mind, uh, you, you, you obey what you've learned. I'm asking you, when you are free, where does your mind naturally, habitually gear towards? Is it reaching out for your iPad or whatever, soft, whatever electronic device you have? Is it naturally going there? Is it naturally surfing? And if you are surfing, where do you naturally go to? Where does your mind by itself, the loins, flap to, flap around in? Let me ask you, when you are stressed, where does your mind habitually seek solace in? Because just look at, look at your Bibles, right? Here we are taught, rejoice in the Lord. Here we are taught, um, be careful for nothing. Here we are taught, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Now, all these things when, are there when you are stressed, when you are pre under pressure, when you're feeling sad and troubled. Where do you let your mind go to? Do you control it to go back to these things that you have learned? Or do you just let it, you want to feel sad, I let it feel sad. You want, you want to feel fearful, I let it feel fearful. I, I, I'm free, he wants to watch movies, I let it go watch movies. You know, when we are stressed, where we are, where we are facing temptations to, to sin, it is the discipline of a habitual mind that, will, that you will guide it to something else and to build a habit in something else that even when you're undergoing those things, that is what makes you stable, my friends. So if you still wonder, why, why do I fall so often? Is it because of that? Now, we need to have this habitual discipline to gird the mind, control the mind. Your mind is the command center, my friends. The command center of your choices, your desires, and eventually your actions. You must know that. That is why Christ made it very clear. Out of the thoughts, out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts. And all these things that defile you, they come from what thought patterns you have, what you think about as well. So it is not just what you think about, right? I want to be clear about that. God gives the list of what to think about, but God uses the word thing to, know, to help us understand that there is that structure in which we have to understand what this thinking is about. What do you, do you control? Now, knowing that your mind is the command center, knowing that your mind is the control center 
all right, the command and control center of your being, of who you will be, who you become, who you are now. Now, then you must be in control of it. You must, in other words, know the trigger points. Now, what do I mean by trigger points? You must know for yourself what will trigger you to fall into sinful thoughts. You must discipline that. Gird up the loins of your mind. Logit zomai. Be disciplined in applying what you learn. Now, what do I mean by trigger points? Every one of us have our own trigger points. For some, a certain thing that you see, for some certain thing that you hear, for some certain thing that you smell, all right? Maybe you used to be a drunkard, all right? That smell of liquor triggers certain desires. Now, the triggering is a temptation. It's not sin yet. James tells us that. But when you allow yourself, you don't discipline yourself, and you allow yourself to be in those situations where the triggers will come, instead of disciplining yourself to avoid those triggers, you put yourself in an unstable situation. You bring yourself into that unstable situation. Why do you think you fall into sin? You know that going to certain websites causes you to fall into sin. But what do you do when you're alone? You don't discipline yourself. When you're in stress, in fact, you find those things to relieve your stress. Smoking, drinking, whatever it is on the website, whether it's shopping, online shopping, or, or whatever. Worse of all, pornography. You find relief in those things rather than disciplining yourself. Know your trigger points and have built a habit of not allowing those to occur in your life. You know what they are. You know, this is the proof, my friends, that thoughts, your thoughts, make you who you are. What do I mean by that? One thing tempts another person, but not you. You are tempted by something that maybe another person may not be tempted by. Why is it so? It's because of what you have allowed yourself to expose yourself to and then develop a desire, for, allow it to become a desire in you and then you act it out, you, you taste it, you feel it, you do it and then now it has a grip on you. Different people, different things. Some grew up, influence. My parents understand this. We studied this in family seminar. What you love in your life as sins your children will develop that and take it to the worst stage. The Bible has shown repeatedly that it's true. Be careful because you are building trigger points in them. What you lust after, whether in public or in secret, they know what your secret, eventually your secrets will be revealed, revealed to them. It will become their witness. It proves that you are what you allow to come in. You allow this, that becomes your witness. Someone else allowed that, that becomes a weakness. If they have not been interested, they were not curious, they, did not, they kept themselves away from those things, just like some people. You can't stand the smell of cigarette and, 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 and liquor and alcohol. Why someone else had that big problem? The exposure that became now part of them. You are what you allow to come in. Now, keep your mind. Don't let it stray. Don't be tempted and curious, young people. Your friends, they participate in certain things. They watch certain things. Don't let that become a weakness in you that you now have to struggle and, and fight in your mind. Like they say, there are things that once you've seen, you cannot unsee. There are things that once you feel, you cannot unfeel. There are things that you, once you experience, you cannot remove that experience. Do not let it stop. Be disciplined. Be disciplined. If you know those are your triggers, stay away from them. What are some of the triggers, my friends? What are some of the avenues by which our thoughts get influenced? Well, I'll just rattle off some. You know yourself. Television. 
watching media. Now, let me clarify this list that I am going to mention. They are by themselves not necessarily sinful, but many things in there, Satan will use them to plant sinful desires in you. All right, please understand. The television, the media, they are not in themselves sinful. But you must guard and filter this, what comes in through your eye gate. Now, Job writes that I made a covenant, Job 31.1, I made a covenant with mine eyes. He made an agreement with his eyes that he will not break. What is it? Why then should I think upon a maid? You see, I made a covenant with my eye. I'm not going to look at a maid, a person of the opposite gender, and look, and second look, and start to think, and lust. You see, I made a promise with my eye that I will not look upon a maid to lust. Because I will, what did Job say? Why should I think? Job did not say, why should I commit adultery? Why should I think? He understood that God gave him this understanding. He wrote for our understanding. Why should I think? Now, my friends, your eye gate is very important. Parents, the eye gate of your children must be guarded. They naturally gravitate to this, and the world will put all sorts of things in front of them. Please don't take it lightly. I'm very tired, I'm very busy. Just let them watch this. When they watch, they're quiet. Watch the eye gate, adults. Guard it. Now, what else? Even when you watch news, watch documentaries, be very careful, be very selective, be very conscious. Magazines, <laughs> advertisements. Now, all these are to plant in you desires. You know, when I was working, um, my colleague invited me to his house, and <clears throat> he had many paintings on the wall. And he kept talking about them, and he kept trying to persuade me to buy some of this art, not from him. He kept talking about this, this painter is very famous. He's the one who, who drew the pictures on our uh, Singapore dollar note and all that. Um, he, he's very famous. So all sorts of drawings. And I thought, look at them. Actually, they look quite ugly to me. All right? And I asked him, how much is this? Oh, $20,000. See, he signed his name there. Why do people become like that? Why is it that for me, not interested? I wonder even why someone would want something like that and pay so much money. The selling to you. You see, if I were to sit there and listen long enough and begin to say, wow, if I own this, drawn by this person, I have this unique one at home that I can show off to my friends that others don't have. Now, if you let yourself... Be open to this avenue that draws you down. Now, you know what it is. What is that lust in your life? Stop, keep looking at it. Stop constantly thinking about it. It's selling to you. The world is selling to you all the time. Why do you think companies pay billions of dollars for advertisements because they know it works once it gets into your eye gate it gets into your mind then the thoughts of your heart will be those things discipline well the internet be very disciplined what about music your ear gate young people the music they are carnal once you get into you it's an addiction that is very difficult to remove Many people who study this topic draws the conclusion that the addiction of people to music has the similar effect of people addicted to actual drugs, contraband drugs. The same effects when they study the brain, they image the brain, the same um, parts are working. The same addiction. When you don't discipline yourself 
you allow this addiction to enter you, these this scenes or sounds to enter you, and start to take root in your heart. Music. Discipline yourself. I'm not saying all music are evil, all right? We've studied that. Go, go listen to that. What about friendships? Where do you get your influence from? Children? In school? Are you constantly guarding and disciplined? When you're with your friends, when they say certain things, when they, when they talk about certain games, when they talk about certain movies, when they talk about certain activities, certain places that they go to, are you guarding your heart or you let them just lead you along? And then slowly say, wow, that is nice. Wow, that is how I should dress. Wow, that is what I should buy. Wow, that is what I should do. Wow, that is what I should be. Same for the adults. Friends, the more time you spend with unbelievers, they may not curse and swear. They may not use the name of Christ in vain. They may not be people who drink and take drugs and um, um, are immodest and uh, carnal and commit fornication. But please know, your friends talk about things of the world. Even things that are not sinful. But slowly those things become your value system. Instead of seeking the kingdom of God first, instead of filling your thoughts about things about God, you will slowly fi fix, uh, fill your minds with things of the world. They may not be sinful things, but now your habitual pattern is not holy thoughts. It's not spiritual mindedness anymore. Friends, friends. The moment you touch about friends, I know many young people get very angry because they're very close to their hearts, same as music. But what are the avenues that causes your mind to be influenced and cause you to be in, in unstable? These are some examples, right? Now then, the last D. The last D. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. Do it. Not just do it, right? Nike, just do it. But it's do it yourself. DIY. Now, why do I say that? The, word, the verb think here is in the middle voice. Middle voice. We studied that this morning at BBK. Now, middle voice means it's something that originates from you. You must be the one who does the act. God chose the middle voice. In fact, this word by itself is, is naturally middle voice. Oh my, all right? Logit zomai. It's middle. Emphasizing that this is something that is not, can, must not be forced, cannot be forced. You must desire it. You must seek it. Why, why do we fall? Now, teens, why do you fall? If you're a believer, somewhere in your heart, you want to obey God. You want to be godly. But you find that you're struggling. Well, we said, are you disciplined? But now the next question is, how do you view all these things that you learn in church, that your parents teach you from the Word of God? Do you view them as, church wants me to live like that? My parents are controlling me. How do you view it? Is it something that I want? I want to control my mind. I want to discipline myself away from the avenues, the areas which I know are particularly my weaknesses. This is what I want. You must move to this mindset. Unless you are saved. If you are not saved, you will still wonder, why, why would anyone want to do that? All these things are so nice to enjoy. You will not have the Holy Spirit that stirs in your conscience to want to be holy, and therefore your thoughts must be godly. Those won't exist. It is your job no one else. No one else can stir desire for depth of thinking, interest in details, disciplining yourself to keep away from certain things or people. It is only what you, you yourself have to strive for, whatever age you may be. I think this is where we also fall easily. Your time management it all depends on you. Where you let yourself gravitate to in your thoughts when you're alone, 
It all depends on you. Remember the pastoral that I wrote? Mind your own business. Your mind is your own business. It must, you must make it your business to discipline it, to think this way. There is no quick fix to st stable Christian walk. Just like last week we learned, there is no quick fix to peace. All the preceding verses are what you need to have peace, and you might put effort in it. Here, Paul does, says, uses the, the word log, logizomai, uses the word that tells us it is something that has to originate from you. You can't sit there and wait for one day I might change. It's something that you go out to do. It's something that you consciously guard, filter. Now, one of this area is this. Fill your mind to the brim, right? To the fullest. Pre Let it be preoccupied with. Let it be very busy in godly thoughts, which we will learn. Let it be very busy in godly thoughts. You know a hard disk or your USB drive? You come to a point where it's full. When it's full, you can't squeeze things in anymore. Now, I know that the mind is unlimited in, in its capacity in a sense, but yeah, humanly speaking on earth, our usage of it is limited. It gets, it gets tired after some time. But before it gets tired, before it gets occupied, fill it with the right things. What do I mean by that? Now, and you have to do this yourself. Sometimes I hear some of you um, comment, and I understand. You comment and say, well, Tuesday and Friday, Bible study, prayer meeting, um, th um, Thursday night, do dig his word, homework, um, Wednesday, Monday night, um, do Far Eastern Bible College um, course or do his homework, um, Saturday, well, either serving God in something or you are trying to do revision. Then on top of that, you have family commitments. On top of that, you have work commitments. On top of that, you have the necessities of life. And then you say, well, oh, you know, can I drop this? Can I drop this? You know, I'm really exhausted. Exhausted. I have no time. No time to think about anything else. Now, do you realize that is this word logizomai? Is filled with details, accounting, constantly using it according to the rules, in the rules, all the time. It is a good thing when you come to a point. Now, I'm not saying that you ignore the responsibilities of life, you ignore your studies, you ignore your responsibilities to your home, in your job, and so on. I'm not saying that. We have to fulfill those things. That's part of your Christian walk, your testimony in the world your service, your ministry. I'm not saying that you ignore those things. But with those things, you occupy your mind with the study of the Word. You come for everything. Even when you're tired, you have left no space for your mind to be idle. We all, if you're honest, we all have to admit, why are we unstable? When did we fall? When did King David fall into the most heinous sin of adultery and murder? The man after God's own heart such a man, but yet he fell into that. When? Not when he was very busy in battle, not when he was writing psalms, not when he was serving God, not when he was under persecution, but when all these things were settled. When he was idle. When the people went out to war, as a king he stayed back instead of going with them. Went up to the rooftop, free. Look around. Oh, my kingdom. Oh, these houses are very nice. <gasps> Woman bathing. Idleness is dangerous for the Christian. Logizomai is to occupy you. That is what it is. Why do we fall? Why are we not stable? Because we do not understand the word that God chooses. Think on spiritual things. Well, we know the saying. 
the idle mind is the devil's bookshop. You give space, you give allowance, you give a desktop to the devil to work things into your mind. Free? What's your habit? It's just surf internet. I'm taking a break. Surf mindlessly without controlling. Then you start to look, ah, like this. Idleness. Busyness is good. Idleness, as we also know, is an idle mind is an idle factory. An idle mind is an idle factory. Right? The idle mind turns out I-D-O-L-S, idols. You will think of all sorts of things. You will develop all sorts of desires. You will want all sorts of things and more and more idols will grow. So, my friends, if you feel that I am really very, very um, tied up with necessities of life and with the word, you are in a good thinking position. Do not feel that it is negative. Do not try to relieve it. Re means lessen it. All right? Now, many have said to me, Pastor, you know, it's when I stop taking these courses, when I stop studying the Word of God, I fall into all sorts of sins. I'm very afraid. Now, friends, you, in closing, I say this. You and I are given a new mind after salvation. But this new mind must be constantly sanctified. That is why God says, be ye transformed. Your transformation to become more and more like Christ depends on this constant renewing of your new mind. Renewing. Thinking in the right pattern about the right things, which we'll learn next week. Paul had a race to run. He used the race to talk, to talk about it. You and I have a race to run. Bad thoughts, uncontrolled thoughts, are you yourself laying all sorts of hurdles in front of your path? That is what it is. You keep tripping yourself up. You slow yourself down. You will fall and hurt yourself. What you allow in the path of your thoughts will make you who you are whether you're successful or not. I began by reading to you Christ's very words from the Bible. Your heart, the thoughts of your heart makes you who you are. In his word, you are what you think. Now, Satan knows this. If you have godly thoughts, you will become more and more Christ-like. The image of Christ will be more and more visible in your life. And that is what God saved us and left us on this earth for. The image of Christ will become clearer and clearer in your life. He hates the image of God. He will do all he can to mar that image. And the entry point where it all begins, he knows, is to work on your thought life. Dear friends, would you not desire to have the mind of Christ? Or would you want to continue in the way you think and still be having the mind of the world? Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. 385, 385, 385. May the mind of Christ my Saviour, 385.